Dean. Thank you. I'm an uh, experimental psychologist. I get to study how we remember, how we think, and how we reason. I'm also a brain researcher. I like to study how the brain's structure enables its functions. And lastly, I like to collect things. I'm a collector. So this talk is about both my work and my hobby. You may know someone who has a very cluttered attic, maybe a cluttered garage or basement, and it's just very hard to move around, and they won't get rid of any of these things. And you're a little worried they might be a hoarder. Probably, you don't have to name names, might be a, a parent or an in-law. We've all been there. Um, I know someone who has a gnome collection, these little figurines of gnomes with pointy hats. Why is it that we, we collect Star Wars memorabilia or shoes or watches or neon signs or comic books? Why do some of our wealthiest citizens spend so much of their time and resources acquiring collectible automobiles or rare works of art? It's fascinating human behavior, and it's very linked to the brain. So there's very much a story here between why we collect things, why we value things, and how the human brain functions. So we'll begin with uh, the fact that we're not the only collector. Uh, there are other species that collect. This is the pack rat. A pack rat's not just a metaphor for someone with too much stuff, it's actually a little foraging rodent. Uh, it's a cute little guy. Uh, notice the rat's brain is very smooth. It doesn't have very much cortex. The cortex is the gray matter of the brain. It allows the processing power that we have. We have a huge amount of cortex relative to the rat's brain. Pack rats pick up little objects and take them back to their nests. If you ever find a rat's nest, it will have all manner of interesting little tidbits and things that are long lost treasures. So rodents have a foraging brain and they have circuitry within their brain, the basal ganglia and the middle frontal lobes. Uh, we have these same regions and they're very sensitive to both experiencing rewards, obtaining rewards, and also uh, anticipating rewards. So this is the thrill of the hunt. It probably drives some of our collecting behavior. In studies of people with hoarding disorders, some of these regions are overly elevated, uh, suggesting they have maybe too much value for certain objects. Another famous collecting species, the magpie. Magpie is uh, known to take jewelry or shiny objects. Magpie syndrome, according to Google, is an irrational affinity for shiny objects. This probably applies much more to humans than it does to actual magpies. There's not tremendously clear scientific evidence they really steal jewelry, um, but crows are very smart animals. Um, look at the crow's brain. It's small, it's also smooth. They have less cortex than we do. Um, but crows have an interesting area called the nidopallium caudolateral, the NCL. What the NCL does is integrate information from all around the crow's brain. So that probably allows it to be a successful problem solver. Crows will actually use sticks or pieces of wire to get food. And they turn out to be very smart in terms of their problem solving abilities, probably based on this integration that they do within their brains. We have a similar region, the frontal lobes. Our frontal lobes are a huge part of our cortex and they integrate signals. They can take signals about value and add signals about emotion and memory. And that very much explains a lot of human collecting behavior. So if we think about humans, probably the first collectors would have been our hunter-gatherer ancestors, and that would have been critical for survival. So being a hunter or gatherer, you would need uh, to save food, save for a rainy day, or if you had useful tools now, it's important to keep them and carry them with you. Thus beginning the human need to pull around a U-Haul trailer everywhere we go. Probably starts there, and to do that behavior, which probably saved our ancestors in the past, uh, because you would have what you'd need later, you have to be able to store episodes in time. And this is a feature of the human brain which is remarkable. We can store uh, situations very abstractly. We can think about what's happened in the past, compare it to our current situations, and project out into the future what we will need. This is cave art. Cave art is one of the signs, uh, a species that can do cave art 
can represent the world in unprecedented ways, uh, representing animals and hunting interactions and even tools in this image. Um, the frontal lobes are probably key to this. We have this very rich representation of our lives and what goes on, and that would be what's needed to be a collecting species the way we are. So collecting may have really saved our species in the past. It's more than just a hobby. Art collectors uh, are hobbyists and collectors, and part of art is uh, a communication between the artist and uh, the viewer, and so we can re-experience those emotions. Again, very abstract and interesting ways that we can encode and think about episodes in our lives. Children are collectors. You might have heard the phrase, collect them all. You might have collected G.I. Joe figures, or Cabbage Patch dolls, or Beanie Babies. Some of the most successful toy lines have capitalized on this idea. If you have one, this beautiful packaging suggests there's all these other ones, and wouldn't it be great to get these? And so this was a big part of my childhood and uh, my kids' childhoods, and so it's just a, a big part of our lives when we were young. Some of us uh, continue to be collectors as adults, and it becomes much more uh, in embellished and and amplified in adults. So um, back in 1991, Wayne Gretzky, the hockey star, and Bruce McNall, the owner of the LA Kings, who had acquired Gretzky in a famous trade, had bought a Honus Wagner baseball card from 1909. This was interesting. It, it was uh, made the news. They'd spent $451,000 on this little piece of cardboard with a picture on it. Uh, that card is now worth $2.8 million at its last trade. So collecting could be purely an investment. We can take value to an extreme like no other species as evidence there. Well, let's think about this card. This was uh, probably one of the early events that led to the enormous enterprise that is sports memorabilia collecting nowadays. Um, it's not just a card. It's a representation of baseball history, sports history, and it's the human story behind these objects that uh, we can appreciate and adds to their value. So the fact that the Gretzky McNall Wagner card, as it's now known, is worth so much is in part because of who owned it. These famous sports figures had owned it. My dad's a collector. He collects Life magazines. He's a photographer and enjoys the visual art of these, uh, of these objects. And uh, his Life magazine collection is more than just about art. It has a very autobiographical quality to it. He grew up in a period when Life magazine was in its heyday. And so a lot of the events that Life uh, focused on and uh, had photography about uh, happened during his lifetime. So it's a way for him to reflect on the events uh, that occurred in his early adulthood. And in that way, it's very personal. So it has this, this strong uh, personal memory. Autobiographical memory is one of the major features of human memory. It's uh, the situations that happen to us. Our early birthdays, our weddings, the birth of our children. These are autobiographical memories and objects that remind us of those things are quite important to us. I mentioned I'm a collector. I collect pinball machines. They're a lot bigger than stamps, that's for sure. Uh, why do I do it? Well, when I was a kid, my brother and I would play pinball at arcades and bowling alleys, and uh, it's, it's an autobiographical memory. It's a part of my life and part of my relationship with my brother uh, connecting over these, these pinball machines. They're also just beautiful electronic art objects. This is my Muhammad Ali pinball machine from 1980. And uh, it's just a fascinating thing to learn about. So it's not only artistic, it says something about the culture at that time. This was Muhammad Ali's last stand as a boxer in 1980. And Pinball is just fun to know about. So this was designed by Stern Electronics, and Harry Williams was the designer. Harry Williams founded Williams Electronics, which built Defender. Some of you might know Defender as a video game that uh, went up against Space Invaders and Pac-Man. Retro arcade uh, industries are very big now, and they're all over cities around the US, and allows us to recapture our youth. And uh, through this hobby, we just like to build our knowledge. So for me, pinball is about knowing about these, um, these different machines. If I mention Twilight Zone or Adam's Family, 
Some of you are thinking those are old television shows. A few of you out there are gonna recognize those are famous pinball machines. You ever played the Twilight Zone in college maybe? In the 1990s, that was one of the major collectibles. It's not an accident that those are pop culture references. We think about them at multiple levels and we can connect over those. So that's one of the last reasons that we really collect and it's connecting with other people who are like-minded. Our brains are very social. We have social rewards. We experience the reward of being around other people. And we have a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin elevates when we're around like-minded individuals in groups, as uh, social psychologists would say. And so our brains likely course with oxytocin when we connect about the time we played Twilight Zone and we dealt with the Powerball, which was this little ceramic ball which came out when you got multi-ball. If you played it, we can talk later and compare notes and our oxytocin levels will rise uh, because it's things we have in common. This is why Comic-Con is an enormous industry now and people dress as Wolverine and Wonder Woman and they go out and meet other adults who have dressed as those same characters and we can bond over these weird, wonderful, interesting facts that all of us share. And so oxytocin is one of the drivers for that within our brains. My people go to the Texas Pinball Festival or the California Extreme where glorious individuals have lugged their heavy arcade equipment to a hotel ballroom. It's set up, we can relive our youth uh, playing these games. And more than that, we can compare notes about that weird, great shared sense of trivia that we have. I mentioned a gnome collector that I know at the beginning of this talk, that turns out to be my mom. I had come home to visit my parents and discovered that my childhood bedroom had been taken over by gnomes. <laughs> Why gnomes? Well, before they were um, the pop culture icons that we know through Travelocity and through uh, these garden gnome animated movies, there was a book on gnomes. It was a beautifully illustrated book by a Dutch writer. And my mom had read the gnome book to my brother and I when we were children. So for my mom, the Gnome Collection is very much about cherished memories of early parenting. And so it's very appropriate that those gnomes live in my childhood bedroom. And I get a little bit, a little bit of an oxytocin feeling when I think about that Gnome Collection now. So when you go to your uh, relative or friend's house and it's just too cluttered, don't call the psychologist just yet to complain that they might be a hoarder. Instead, ask them about their collection. You might find that there's an interesting personal story, autobiographical details about these objects. And then we can elevate value to such a tremendous degree because we integrate memories into these different objects. So my advice would be collect things, go on eBay and experience that thrill of uh, the rush when you, when you win an auction, it's a great thing. And uh, also connect with others, discuss your hobbies with other people and you'll probably find that you can make friends and have interesting connections. It will enrich your life. And our brains are wired to collect. Thank you.